The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. What is about to unfold is the occult experience of a frustrated man, James Archer, and of what happened to him when he stepped beyond reality as we know it. I think I can safely say that each of us has had an experience so frustrating that we'd have given anything in the world to have had the power to overcome it. James Archer was given that power. mystery drama, Strange Passenger, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars Nat Poland and Bob Caliban. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Have you ever looked up at the night sky and the moon hanging there and just wondered? Man is finite. He can comprehend anything with definable limits. But beyond such limits is an incomprehensible universe. We increase our knowledge about outer space each year, but what we know is very small. The mystery of life is a secret that still has to be revealed. But one corner of it was lifted for James Archer. Aren't you Archer, Jim Archer? Who are you? A recruiter. I was in court yesterday when you demolished a client of ours as... Oh, now, what did you label me? Oh, oh yes, an obscene slumlord. Uh, it was yesterday. I just wanted to tell you how much I admired your plea for the plaintiffs. Thank you. Uh, sit down, if you'd like. You're not expecting anyone? No. Oh. <laughs> Just sitting here wondering what to do next. Are you a lawyer? Oh, an obscure one in a big firm. Ah, thanks for coming over. I've been uh, feeling sorry for myself. You must know what happened today. Yes, the case was settled out of court. Yeah, it's known as compromise. I call it dishonesty. Well, the slumlord is a rich man. He's agreed to make some restitution for his neglect. Yeah, it's a nice way of saying he paid off someone and the case was settled. He should have gone to jail. Ideally, yes. When I found out that my firm had worked out a settlement without first telling me, I resigned. Oh, I see. Our clients, the plaintiffs, got promises. A few months rent-free... Charges will be dropped for willful destruction they done in the building. He should have been forced to repair the heating system, exterminate the rats, install sanitary plumbing, make the building fireproof, and pay a stiff fine. Even go to jail, as an example to others like him. You really are a crusader, aren't you? Injustice makes me sick. So sick, it's put you out of work. That's right. I don't mind. I guess it's unfair to my wife and little girl. Well, I'm sorry. It's after six. I'd better telephone home and tell my wife the happy news. Uh, one moment, Mr. Archer. Hmm? What would you be willing to do for security, authority, and the opportunity to practice those ideals which you hold so precious? That's not amusing, Mr. Recruiter. No, 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 no. I mean it. I mean it. What would you do? I'd do anything. Ah. Then I... I think I can arrange just such a life for you and for your family. <laughs> Come with me. Oh, recruiter, so you have found a man of integrity. Ah, yes, Cosmo, this is James Archer, a gifted lawyer who believes that law and justice should never be compromised. Is that correct, Mr. Archer? Yes. May I ask where I am? Where we are is unimportant. You came here of your own free will. You are under no obligation to stay. If you say so, we will transport you back to the city. No, no, thank you. At least, not until I've heard what this is all about. 
how can you guarantee me an honest, uncompromising life? Because I represent, in fact, I embody a viewpoint that is both utopian and attainable. <laughs> and what is that? The bloodless establishment on your earth of a society in which each man is equal, in which each earthling will lead a happy life, a society in which certain outstanding men such as you can become, will re-establish moral values and strive to relate to life beyond Earth. Well, that's mumbo-jumbo, but it sounds good. It's not mumbo-jumbo. You say that because you cannot see above the daily scratching and clawing for survival. <laughs> All right, Mr. Cosmo. What do I have to do in order to attain this utopia of yours? Who pays my salary? What about insurance, pension? Ah, oh, details. You will never need to worry about any of them. And while you are away, before you begin your mission, your wife and child will be provided for. My mission? Yes. Soon after it begins, you will rise swiftly. You will become a man of importance locally, then statewide, and then perhaps in your nation. You will proclaim what you honestly think. No more compromise, no watering down of the law or of justice. Mr. Recruiter? Uh, yes? Are you sure I'm not still in that bar trying to forget my worries? Oh, I am very sure. The opportunity that has come to you has come to only a few others on Earth. Just who are the two of you? There's something very weird about all this. It seems so because you are earthbound, Mr. Archer. Are you saying... No, no, that's nonsense. I know that a lot of people report flying objects. There have been drawings of funny little men with pointed antennae for ears and all sorts of things. <laughs> no rational person gives them a second thought. You don't have to believe, Mr. Archer. You are free to leave. When you arrive home, you will appear to have overstayed your time at that restaurant, and you won't remember a word of what followed after. I can, in fact, right now, blank out the names of your wife and child. <laughs> you mean... Now, wait a minute. Their names are... You... you can do that. <laughs> Very easily. Ready to quit... Mr. Archer... Uh, no. No? I think I'll see this through. Ah, that is an incredible honor, Mr. Archer. Recruiter, bring in the ship and we will be on our way. Your father tells me a strange story, Mrs. Archer. Oh, it's worse than strange. It's bizarre. It's over three months now since my husband just... He just vanished. But on the first of each month... I covered that, Nan. That money deposited in the bank the first of each month is what led me to see Major Wayne. What do you make of it, Major? First, uh, Mrs. Archer, tell me again everything you remember from the night your husband didn't come home. Well, he'd resigned from his job. He... He went to a bar near his office and sat down to think over what he'd done. Some acquaintance joined him and then they left. Well, next, the Missing Persons Bureau called to... to have... to have me identify a body they'd found in the river. It was dressed in Jim's clothes and I... I guess it was Jim. You thought so too, Dad? Yes, I did. Both of us had misgivings because... Because it, it just made no sense. Jim was as straight as an arrow. He... Well, unless he'd been murdered, we somehow just couldn't believe that the body was his. No other uh, person in his life? Absolutely not. No, Major. Jim Archer lived for his work and for his family. He was a thoroughly honest man. And the body found in the river had died from a violent stroke as if it had been electrocuted? Anything else, Mrs. Archer? I know about the insurance and the mysterious deposits of money. Uh, tell him, Nan. Well, there is something else, Major Wayne, but... Oh, it's, it's so far out. I... 
Oh, I just haven't told anyone except my dad. Well, tell me. The night Jim disappeared, Penny and I were watching the news. Uh, Penny's seven, old enough to read. And all of a sudden, words began to run across the bottom of the screen like, you know, when a, when a bulletin is superimposed over the picture? Yes. Well, the words were, don't worry, Nan, I'm all right. Don't worry. Love, Jim. And those sentences ran across the bottom of the screen. Yes, time after time, half the evening long. I telephoned the TV station, but they thought I was some kind of a nut. Did your daughter see the sentences? No. And uh, she was watching with you and she can read? Yes. I know it sounds incredible, Major Wayne. I have no reason to disbelieve you, Mrs. Archer. Well, what the devil do you make of it? I don't know quite what to say. I don't want to give you hope, but I think that James Archer, voluntarily or by force, has been transported from the Earth to some planet beyond sight and comprehension. Oh, what? come now, Major. You, you mean by, by one of those unidentified flying objects? Yes, that's just what I mean. Why? Well, that's yeah. absurd. You, do you mean to tell me our intelligence gives even the slightest credence to that Buck Rogers kind of thing? Mr. Weber, let me give you some facts. As long ago as 1959 in Boinani, New Guinea, the Reverend William B. Gill, his assistants, and the entire student body of his missionary school, about 27 persons, observed a strange object hanging in the sky a few hundred yards away. It was oval-shaped and had a deck on its top like an observation deck. Gill saw what looked like men and waved to them, and they waved back. Then the object raised up and flew straight off into the sky. Good glory. There were many remarkable sightings in Michigan in 1966. The UFO craft looked like a huge pie, well lighted with red, blue, and white lights spinning all around it. There had been sightings in Delaware, Illinois, Tennessee, South Dakota, Mississippi. In fact, almost everywhere. And you think that, that there really is such a thing as an unidentified flying object? There's no question about it. You terrify me, Major Wayne. Yes, it terrifies me, too. And you, you think that maybe one of them carried Jim off? I don't know. It's a possibility. Well, but why Jim? I can't answer that. What, what do we do? We have agents in many parts of the country. I'll alert them to Mr. Archer's disappearance. And, uh, Mr. Weber. Yeah, yes, Major. I'll need your cooperation. I want to know when those deposits are made and who makes them. If it's a human, I'll want to ask some questions. Well, Mr. Archer, what do you think? It's magnificent. Beautiful green fields, homes, even light. Incredible. And the people? Well, to be honest, they're strange looking to me. But I'm only used to human beings. These people are shorter, round, flat-faced, with quite sharp ears. Disease-free, untroubled, and super-intelligent. You will soon be free to visit with them. I'm ready now. Soon. Mm, the surgery, I have been told, was perfect. You now possess a brain as extraordinary as ours. And your face has been altered very skillfully. All that is left of you is the name. Stuart Murdoch. Where did you come from, and what is your mission on the planet Earth? I have no remembrance of where I came from or who I was. My mission on Earth is to become a leader of my people and to prepare them for your bloodless conquest of my country. You have been away from Earth for six months. He is ready, recruiter. Oh, yes. Take him among our people for a week, then fly him back. Drop him outside Fargo, North Dakota, supply him with money, and return. Yes, I... And let nothing interfere with those regular deposits of money. It will have to compensate. He now belongs to us. Pure fantasy? Unidentified flying objects? One researcher wrote that he thought the phenomenon was so far outside the laws of present scientific knowledge 
that UFOs could be considered ridiculous. But once he was exposed to the hard facts, he concluded that the existence of this unexplainable phenomenon is, and I use his exact word, overwhelming. The strange story of James Archer, the recreated man, will continue in a few moments. And who is to say that what has happened to James Archer is impossible? Dr. Faustus sold his soul to the devil in exchange for 24 years of every pleasure and all knowledge at his command. And James Archer's state of mind has led him in the same direction. It is, remember, six months since Archer vanished, literally into thin air. Excuse me, Mr. Weber. Major Wayne. Uh, it's Thompson here, sir, field agent. Anything? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, an unidentified flying object was seen hovering in this Fargo area late this afternoon. I see, and? Well, I'm at the Nygaard farm about 30 miles northwest of Fargo in a small community named Shoshone Creek. It's uh, pretty desolate. Apple and I put down our two-seater in one of Nygaard's fields and taxied it to the side of a big barn. Good. See if the UFO lands and if anyone leaves it. If so, follow the man. Don't pick him up, but don't lose him. I want to learn where he goes. Yes, sir. Well, this is fantastic, Major. If I mentioned any part of this... this weird conversation to my friends, they'd think I was ready for a mental hospital. Well, you're not, Mr. Weber. It's real enough. Oh, and, uh, let me give you a warning. Yes? Let's say that James Archer is returning by a UFO to Earth from wherever he's been. He'll be returning for a purpose, and to achieve that purpose, he won't be the same man. I don't quite understand. If, as I suspect, he was chosen by some power from another planet because he had soured on his life and our civilization, and if that power has some objective on our planet Earth, you can be sure that Archer's been brainwashed and indoctrinated deeply. So, uh, even though he might look the same... He probably won't. We had uh, one experience in which a man who had vanished was brought back into custody. He was not the same man he had been. He'd become a robot. We had to institutionalize him. An exceptionally intelligent man, but dangerous to us. Later, he was found in his room dead. Somehow, he'd been electrocuted. Well, that's why you thought the... The body in the river... Yes, it got me thinking. Now, uh, tell me about those deposits, Mr. Weber. Promptly, the first of the month, a cash deposit of $5,000 is made to the account of my daughter. We alerted our bank security guards, and when the last deposit was made through the night deposit slot, one of the guards spotted the man who dropped it. I have a description of him here. Good. I'll have one of my agents try to spot him and follow him. Then we'll pick him up for questioning. It might be ticklish. We have nothing against the man. I, uh... I may need your daughter's cooperation. Major, I... I don't want to expose her to danger. I don't think there'll be any, but uh, we'll be careful. I'm very aware that you've already lost a son-in-law. Jim Archer was a fine young man. <laughs> Oh, hello. Don't be afraid. Come up to the front of the church. I'm Reverend David Hode, the minister. Well, I, uh, I apologize for entering. Never apologize for entering a house of God. Who, who are you, young man? Stuart Murdoch. Not from around here, are you? No. Can I do something for you? Well, I didn't enter to, uh, to do any damage, Mr. Hode. I should hope not. We don't have vandals out here on the prairie. Are uh, you lost? Am I near Fargo? About 30 miles by the state highway. Do you have a car? 
No, but if you'll point me in the right direction... Glad to, but uh, you won't find much traffic at this time of night. Uh, I take it you're hitchhiking. Unless there's someone around here who'd drive me to the airport. I have money. There's something on your mind, Mr. Murdoch. Uh, anything I can do to help? Oh, no, I'm fine. Have you, uh... Have you been in the church for... No, 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 you just walked in, am I right? Yes, a minute ago. And before that, you were outside? Yes, yes. Now, if you'll show me the way to... Of course, of course, all in good time, Mr. Murdoch. Uh, m may I ask you a question? Did you see what I saw, and is that why you've come here? What did you see? A saucer-shaped thing hovering in the sky and then coming close to the ground, not far from old Nils Nygaard Farm, half a mile from here. What do they call um, an unidentified flying object? And you think you saw such a thing? I know I saw it. I'll be going along. Others saw it, too. I came to my church to pray to God to protect all of us. From what? Satan. Reverend Hode, there is no such thing as Satan. It is in a man's self that he is good or evil. Young man, I believe in God, and he sustains me. And in believing in him, I accept Satan as a fact. A fact of what? He was cast out of heaven and is the chief monarch of hell. Of hell, which is? Many things, Mr. Murdoch. Satan corrupts mankind. The struggle to possess a soul for good or for evil goes on in a man forever. The presence of God within you cannot be extirpated. Then I don't have anything to worry about. Well, the day will come, I assure you, when you will feel his presence and he will help you to decide what is right. Okay, if you say so. You have been infected, haven't you? Odd you didn't see that unidentified flying object. Oh, I saw it. The fact is, I had a ride in it. You know something? You just may have it that. Well, thank you, Reverend Holt. He's the man we want. Well, tell me about him, Mr. Thompson. Uh... You are an intelligence agent? Oh, uh, yes, sir. Here's my identification. Oh, uh, who is this Mr. Murdoch? Uh, he's a New York lawyer named Archer who vanished six months ago. Uh, you may not believe in such things as UFO, oh, but... Oh, but I do, yes. I saw the thing laying less than a mile away. Uh, what's this uh, Murdoch up to? Uh, we don't know, Reverend, but... Major Wayne thinks Murdoch sold himself to some power in outer space and has been returned to Earth to carry out some mission. To what end, Mr. Thompson? Oh, we don't know that. I, I just saw him go into your church, and my orders were just to follow him. He's headed for Fargo in New York. All right, then, Appleton and I will fly to the airport there and wait for Murdoch to board a plane. We'll board the same one for New York. I wish you well. Murdoch is a personable young man if some force about which we are ignorant has possessed him don't despair the god-given more force within each of us will be stronger than the power of satan given time mr murdoch will reject having sold his soul and then what heaven alone knows <laughs> He comes in here almost every day after work. Oh, I'm terribly nervous, Major. Not uh, Major, Mrs. Archer. I'm just plain Bill Wayne, your accountant, and you're Nancy. Have you got that straight? Yes, of course, uh, Bill. It's a quarter to six. He ought to be along any... Uh-oh, that's the man. Oh, yeah. He's taking a seat in that booth. You know what to do. Yes. Wish me luck. I, uh... I beg your pardon? Oh, yes. Uh, my name is Mrs. James Archer. Uh, may I uh, speak with you for just a minute? All right. All right. Please sit down. Oh, thank you. Uh, who are you motioning to? Uh, Bill Wayne, my uh, my accountant. 
join me, Bill? Uh, my name's Bill Wayne. Oh, how do you do? <laughs> you, uh, followed me here? Oh, no, no. I come in here almost every day. Uh, Mrs. Archer came into the city today, and I invited her to have a cocktail with me. Are you, uh... Well, are Mrs. Archer and her accountant supposed to mean something to me? Well, you see, you've been identified as the man who deposits $5,000 in my account every month. I, uh, I just wanted to meet you and uh, to thank you. I really don't know what you're talking about, Mrs. Uh, uh, Archer, was it? Yes. Uh, well, if uh, Mrs. Archer has made a mistake, we apologize for it. Uh, are you mistaken, Nancy? Well, I don't think so. I, um... Uh... I have a picture with me. You see? had someone take my picture? Well, you see, my father's president of the bank, and he wanted it done. Does he make a practice of taking pictures of his depositors? Well, you, you see, my husband vanished six months ago, and he still keeps supplying me with this very generous amount of money each month. You must admit it's strange. You say he vanished? Yes. Oh, yes, I vaguely remember the name now. Uh, Archer, wasn't he... Wasn't his body found in the Hudson River? Well, uh, a body was found. And identified. Well, uh, yes. Then what you've told me is impossible. I agree with you. A dead man could not make monthly deposits to his widow. That's what's been troubling Nancy. She thought that if she could meet the man who made the deposits, she might get an explanation. And be given some, uh, hope. Hope? That, that Archer is still alive? Well, that also sounds impossible. Well, if we've made a mistake... Uh, well, this is the picture of you, though, isn't it? Mr... I don't know your name. Uh, recruiter. Yes, that does look like me. But, uh, you're not the person who makes the deposits? May I ask what? difference it makes who provides you with money, Mrs. Archer? Oh, it doesn't really. I'm I'm grateful. But I keep thinking that if Jim is still able to provide for me, he he just might be alive somewhere. Just as a matter of business, Mr. Recruiter, we have to find out where the money comes from. It's, uh, it's source. Oh, I'm afraid I can't help you. The money comes to me and I'm just instructed to make the monthly deposits. Who? I mean, uh, where do the instructions come from? Can you tell me that? Anonymous. Somehow it doesn't seem right. If uh, Mr. Archer did someone an enormous favor... Uh... Well, uh, did he? Do you know if he did? Ah, I never met the man. Now, you'll excuse me. No, oh, goodbye, Mrs. Archer, and enjoy the money. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Wayne. I wouldn't worry about the money. He knows... Consider the name. Ever heard of anyone named Recruiter? He's one of them, whoever they are. We are eavesdropping on a grotesque subject, UFOs, about which there isn't much doubt. But those who fly them who are they from what place in outer space do they come what are they and are they friends or enemies from what we have heard james archer's mission is to become a preeminent person in our society he is to prepare us for a bloodless overthrow of the several ways of life represented on our planet why I'll be back with Act Three shortly. In any contest, it is wise never to underestimate the strength of the enemy. But what do we do when confronted by an incomprehensible force, one beyond finite understanding? Major Wayne of Intelligence knows what has been going on, but what can he do about it? We have never captured an unidentified flying object, and we only have reports that they have been seen at a distance. Six months have now elapsed, and it is a year since James Archer disappeared. The deposit was made as usual. 
Well, why can't Major Wayne force that Mr. Recruiter to tell him where the money comes from? There's no law, Nan, to prevent a man from dropping money for you in the night slot at the bank. He's not committing a crime. One of these days, Recruiter will be seen with Jim, and then Wayne moves in. All about the only person Recruiter sees is that man who's become assistant to the special prosecutor. What's his name? Uh, uh, Murdoch? Yes. Stuart Murdoch. Yes. A remarkable young man. Brilliant lawyer and great presence. He'll go far. He's a leader, and we haven't got many of them around these days. If I live long enough, I think I'll see Murdoch governor... He's an unusual man. So was Jim. Yes, I agree, Nancy. I was proud to have him as my son-in-law. You know, if you think about it soberly, Dad, both of us are not all there in the sink department. Who could believe that Jim might be alive in outer space? A year ago, I would have laughed at the idea. Now, I don't know. We have to rely on Major Wayne. Well, I'm not going to much longer. Well, just what do you mean by that? I'm moving into the city. What? Sell your home? Take Penny out of school? Oh, let's face it. I'm still young and alive. I want to be with people among them. I'll find a job and Penny can go to private school. Jim is dead. Penny and I are alive. And we need to rip this... this shroud off from over us. Happy to meet you, Reverend Hode. Uh, you remember Thompson? I sure do. It's uh, nice of you to have invited me to New York, my first visit. Uh, it's an impressive sight. Well, how are you, Mr. Thompson? I just fine, sir, thank you. You're still keeping an eye on our visitor from space? You, uh, you think that, Reverend Hode? Well, I suspect it. Uh, let me put it that way. That, uh, that was an unusual experience for me. That young man just appearing in my church, Stuart Murdoch. Yes, I've been following his career. He's what you uh, brought me here to talk about, isn't it, Major? Yes, uh, you've met him and uh, you've talked with him. And I'm sorry for him. He's getting what he set out to achieve, but Stuart Murdoch, whether or not he was put down from a spaceship as a soul possessed. Well, uh... Tell me, what, what do you want me to do? Well, I want you to give a small party. Thompson, arrange it with the hotel. All right, Major. Do you want me to invite the guests? No, uh, you invite Mrs. Archer. She's a little uh, cool toward me these days, and uh, I'll invite her father. No, no, no. You invite both of them. Just tell them that, uh, that you want them to meet a friend of yours from North Dakota who may have something to say that will be of interest to them. Mrs. Archer. Oh, oh yes, yes. Yeah. We think there's a chance that Stuart Murdoch is the former James Archer. Nancy Archer is the presumed widow. The other person you'll meet will be Hugo Weber, her father. And I'll be there as Bill Wayne, Mrs. Archer's accountant. So, uh, there'll be five of us. I should be most happy to help you if I can. Well, recruiter. I, uh, I'm troubled, Cosmo. Why? Uh, Mr. Murdoch is everything we expected him to be. Oh, that's true. He's risen rapidly and he has already become a public figure. But I'm troubled about him. When I dropped him in North Dakota, it seems that he wandered into a church and he met the minister there, a Reverend David Hold, who filled him with talk about Satan, soul, God, and conscience. Murder couldn't have been affected by that nonsense. No, but murder remembers Hold and often brings up his name. The man made an impression on Murdoch. And you find that to be a distraction? When Murdoch was transformed and brainwashed, was all of his conscience removed? I assume so. That is what the report indicated. Do you suspect that he has some vestige of conscience left? I don't know. But the thought troubles me. Uh, 
are right on time, Reverend. Oh, five o'clock. Let's hope it all goes well. Now, Mrs. Arch and the others should be right along. Hello, Mr. Hode. I'm so glad you could stop in to see me, Mr. Murdoch. Thank you. Uh, meet Joe Thompson, a member of my church back home. Uh, Joe, is this uh, Stuart Murdoch? Uh, I do. How do, you do? Uh, sit down, Mr. Murdoch. We have a uh, tea or whatever else you'd like. Tea, please. Oh, good. I, I don't try to impose my tastes on others. <laughs> I thought that was your job, Reverend. Shoving your convictions down the throats of others? No, no, not not shoving, young man. I, I expose my convictions to them, and uh, then it's up to the individual to accept or to reject the truth. The truth, as you see it. It's the word of God, which is a truth. I'm, I'm just one of his messengers. Uh, that's one of the reasons I wanted to see you while I was in New York. You're my messenger from God? Yes, I do believe I am. I... I knew that when you wandered into my church in Shoshone that... Uh, well, remember when we talked? You, you remember, of course. Every word of your mumbo-jumbo, Reverend. You said that the presence of God within each person cannot be extirpated. Uh, here's your tea, Mr. Murdoch. Thank you. Hmm. Well, I'm afraid you were wrong, Reverend. I'm unchanged. I haven't had to whistle for God's help. I've helped myself. And as you may know, I've been very successful. But uh, you're here, Mr. Murdoch. You, you didn't forget me. Of course not. I liked you when we met, and I'm happy to see you again. Oh, that should be the others, Reverend Hood. How old are the men? Uh, friends of neighbors back in Shoshone. You don't mind, do you? No, no, certainly not. Mr. Weber, Mrs. Archer, I'm so glad you could stop in. Uh, this is uh, Stuart Murdoch, the man I was telling you about. Uh, hello, Mr. Murdoch. I'm happy to meet you. My father, Mr. Weber. How do you do? And, uh, Bill Wayne, uh, a friend. Hello, hello gentlemen. Hello. Uh, Joe, uh, yes, tea fall. Um, it's a uh, real honor meeting you, Mr. Murdoch. Well, thank you. We've been following your career, Nancy and me, and, uh, I must say we like the way you've ripped into corruption and graft. The public is entitled to honesty in government. Well, that's what they all say, but, uh... You seem to mean it. And my actions, I hope, prove it. My, uh, my late husband felt that way, too. I mean, about honesty. Yes, Jim Archer was an honest man. All that got him was his resignation from his job. He couldn't stand hypocrisy. He wouldn't compromise. I can't either. But I've learned that, that one has to prepare others slowly for the truth. Not your version of truth, Reverend. Truth is invisible, young man. The truth I preach is God's word. Truth is an ideal, and it is divine. Well, I think that's foolish. Truth, like any other commodity, has to be sold. If you'll excuse me, I do have to be going. I'm happy to have met all of you. And Reverend Hode, do pay New York another visit. I can find my way out, Mr. Thompson. Well, Mrs. Archer? No, Major. Stuart Murdoch isn't Jim Archer transformed in space and returned to Earth. Why, the, the very idea is absurd. Astonishing. An obscure minister from North Dakota has created wonder in your mind. He insinuates the thought of God and conscience into your mind, even though you know, as we know, that both are fiction. You still are earthbound. Well, Mr. Murdoch, we seem to have failed. It has happened before, but not often. I can offer you a choice. A return to our planet for a short time, and then resume your mission on Earth, or remain here now. I... I don't know what to do. Why can't we go on as we have been? I'll carry out the mission. I'm afraid that's no good, Mr. Murdoch. The very fact that you wonder if you've been infected with Satan's moral virus, whatever that might be, creates a doubt about your reliability. Order the ship. Are you, uh, taking me back into space, Cosmo? No. You will remain here. 
you will be returned to what you would have become after you resigned from your job and before you accepted recruiter's offer. <laughs> and what would that be? Still an unemployed lawyer? That will be for others to discover. <laughs> Open the door, Thompson. Follow me. Have your gun ready. Yes, sir. The house feels empty. There's a light at the end of the... Huh. Look over there, sir. In that chair. Good Lord. Why, that's... That's James Archer. I know from pictures of him, it's... it's... Asleep. Yeah, or drugged. His hair has turned gray, and, uh... Look at his face. Worn and haggard. He... He looks like a drunk sleeping it off. Archer. Arch... What is it, Major? His... His hand is cold as ice. He's... Dead. <laughs> So, as Cosmo said, James Archer was returned as what he would have become after he lost his job and tried to sell his soul to a force from outer space. Had Cosmo read the future? It would appear so. It is very possible that James Archer was so depressed with his future that he allowed himself to deteriorate into the condition in which he was found. I will return shortly. Frustration leads some of us in dangerous directions. For most of us, however, hope extends a hand to lift us up from despair. James Archer never grasped that hope. He angrily preferred the path that led him to become the instrument of a force from another planet whose goal is the bloodless conquest of Earth, not by invasion, but by indoctrination. He saved his soul, even though it cost him his life. Our cast included Nat Polan, Bob Caliban, Evie Jester, Ian Martin, and Frank Behrens. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. The preceding program was broadcast with the permission of the Columbia Broadcasting System. Next tale. You're all ready to put up your hands. What for, ready? Why? What happened? I cut a corner too sharp. I caught a bumper on a taxi. He had a small scratch. I had a small dent. Both of us figured it would be better to keep it quiet. Don't you ever do that again. Do what again? Put another mark on that bus. Eddie... Tell me something. What's this concern uh, you and that bus? And another thing, you are riding the clutch. And you jackrabbit a lot when you start. Oh, come on. I can hear it. I can detect signs of it. Uh, Eddie, you talk like this here, you, you can scare a guy. I, I mean, you I hope I'm scaring you, Jerry. Scaring you into treating this bus decently because... Yeah? Because if you don't, I'm going to kill you. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs>